Good morning. I am Janice Newsom, assistant professor in the University of Houston Clear Lake College of Education Library Science Program. Thank you for joining us today for the University of Houston Clear Lake Black History, Mo Black History Month Lift Every Voice Still Rising Program. UHCL joined with America and four other countries around the world to celebrate the cultural, technological, and scientific achievements of Black Americans. The 2020 national theme for Black History Month is the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. The UHCL family focus uh, focused our celebration on the poetic and artistic heritage of African Americans. Our program is a part of the Lift Every Voice project, which is a year long nationwide celebration of the 250 year tradition of African American poetry. The UHCL Art Gallery is featuring the art of Charles Washington, a retrospective which will run through March 19th, 2021. This morning, we will feature the public works of Floyd Newsom, the public artworks of Floyd Newsom. This work can be enjoyed and experienced in the Houston downtown area, Acres Homes, and in Fort Worth. Enjoy. Following this brief video, Dr. Pedro will bring you a more fitting welcome. I will share my screen now and hope that this works. Our technology has been. They've had some kind of theme I need to follow. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. So that kind of changes. Right. right? <laughs> the content yeah, from the very it, beginning it, it is kind different. Of changes. Right. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But in a hundred years, what do you want art historians to be writing about you? And so I've had about what four or five commissions uh, that involve public art. And some of those works, they they involve some of the symbols that I use in my paintings, like the ladder in Acres Home. There's a, there's a ladder suspended from the ceiling. It's called the Ladder of Hope. What someone to remember of me 100 years now is that Floyd Newsom understood that an artist did not limit himself to one meaning. Dare to to do other things. This particular piece, uh, especially the large piece, the, the planter, it has a, a small abstraction of the of the Astrodome. Then there's a representation of the Pennzoil building. There are elements that look like street or or water, like Buffalo Bayou or White Oak Bayou. You know, so there, there are several parts of, of this piece that are sort of descriptive of, of the city itself and its development. The stems makes it seem as though it's, it's sort of a, a, a forest in the middle of, of, of downtown. Kids love this piece. They run through it. They have a great time mingling with the piece. As a matter of fact, one of the nicknames for this, for this piece is called Peanuts. Art, when it's incorporated in, in an urban environment, it gives the audience an opportunity to be engaged with it. Their reaction can sometimes be positive, sometimes can be negative, but there's still a reaction. You allow the audience to, to look, investigate, interpret the work. And so that's what art's purpose is, is, is to engage people, to have some kind of a conversation. And so when people go through my work, they have this opportunity to look, and mingle and and then have a conversation about what they feel about the work, how they interpret the work. And I think that's very important.
Good morning, everyone. I am Joan Pedro, and I'm the Dean in the College of Education. This morning, I want to welcome all of you today as we are celebrating our Black History Month's final event with our Lift Every Voice project. As Janice told you, this is a year-long nationwide celebration with the 250-year tradition of African-American poetry, which is directed by the Library of America in partnership with the Schlumberg Center for Research and Black Culture in every state. Lift Every Voice aims to highlight the richness and diversity of African-American poetic imagination and its central place in American history. As you have already seen the works of Mr. Floyd Newsom that are so inspiring and conversational and all can engage in looking, observing, and conversing about his pieces. Today, we are going to feature Miss Deborah Deep Bilton, who is an internationally known writer, educator, activist, and the first Black Poet Laureate of Houston. She will presenting us with wonderful poetry today. You will hear more about Miss Bilton later on. I am sure this is going to be an exciting event. And I know that we will all leave here today. We will leave this celebration reflective of how far we have come and how we must continue to work on behalf of all our students as equitable and socially just gatekeepers. So I want you to have a wonderful time, listen to the poetry and share in the celebration as we end Black History Month for yet another year. Thank you so much. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Felix Simiu, the Interim De Associate Dean for the College of Education, who is going to bring greetings from the college. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to bring you greetings for attending this wonderful opportunity to capture a glimpse into one of the subtle aspects of our community. These poets are con continuing traditions of sharing experiences through the art of spoken word to bring meaning to the trials, tribulations, successes, and jubilations of our multiple perspectives while continuing the learning about Black history and so much of what it represents. Although we're spending this month and particularly this day to celebrate and learn, my hope is that we take more than just one month to continue the learning, having the hard conversations, the empathy to understand, and most importantly, the willingness to grow with one another beyond just the month of February. Today, you're in for a treat with our special guest that we have for you. I encourage you to sit back, relax, enjoy, and engage in the experience of the spoken word you will hear at this wonderful event. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary Sutton and I'm National Endowment for the Humanities, Scholar in Public Humanities and Project Manager for Lift Every Voice. Lift Every Voice is a nationwide celebration of the 250 year tradition of African American poetry directed by the Library of America, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. The project was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Mellon Foundation and Emerson Collective. The initiative features five signature events in New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles and Kansas City, as well as smaller public programs such as this one in 49 sites around the country. Lift Every Voice not only provides communities with opportunities to learn more about the Black poetic tradition, but to engage with it through readings, musical performances, 
seminars, conversations, and other programs that illustrate the ways in which poetry is all around and how it enriches our daily lives. We hope that today's program offers helpful insights and ideas that you will integrate both in the classroom and in your lives outside of the classroom. Thank you for participating in Lift Every Voice. But at this time in our program, we would like for Dr. Seahorn to introduce our MC, give us some background into who she is, and we will go forward for the, with the program from there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Yes, I would like to uh, make sure we play the other videos. So when we have that available at the end, probably um, at, as sort of a closing session, we'll make sure to get that in for you. Um, I would really prefer not to feature myself today and to let um, Dr. McCauley kind of run this session and get the poets geared up and ready for you. She's a poet herself. She's gonna do a much better job of it than I will. And so, um, Dr. McCauley, would you mind stepping in here and, and taking us through, um, through your introduction? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am really just so excited to be here and what a wonderful um, uh, afternoon of poetry we have for you. Uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Maritza McCauley and I teach creative writing and literature in UHCL's literature department. Um, and also again, thank you so much for coming to this event and for sharing your energy with us today. Um, we have an absolutely fabulous listing of poets in store for you. Um, these poets are bright, majestic, shining voices that speak truth to power. Um, so um, like Dr. Seahorn was saying, uh, the mics are off, so you are free to snap, clap, cheer, affirm them in any way. Um, you can throw that little, um, that link, not link thing, what do you um, call that? the little button that makes that lets you applause on the zoom <laughs> you can do that um so you can just pretty much do anything that, that that affirms our poets um also you can leave comments um in the chat box for our poets um this is a spoken word event so your audience participation is definitely encouraged um and at the end you can please stay around for a Q and A because we'll be talking um, with the poets after we hear their, their work. Um, so um, on that note, um, you know, maybe we should just start, we, sh we can just uh, keep things rolling. Um, so uh, Joanne is here in the, yeah, I see, I see her. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so Joanne Ariam. Um, is a 19-year-old writer and performer from Houston, Texas. Her writing explores the Black experience at the intersection of womanhood, queerness, and religion. Joanne is also a Space City Grand Slam champion and a member of the Metaphor Houston Slam team. She's currently studying neuroscience, wow, at Baylor University. Um, yeah, so welcome Joanne. Hi everyone, one second. Hi y'all, my name is Joanne Ariam. Um, I'm a sophomore at Baylor University and I study neuroscience. Um, yeah, and this is my poem. It's titled Black Girl, White God. <clears throat> Black girl sing in the dead of night. Take these broken dreams and learn to fly. All your life, you've been waiting for this moment to arrive. I'm a black girl living in a white man's world, and I love it. It's not the closest thing to equity you've ever heard. 
at 15, I met Jesus, or some variation of him, unlit body on brown crucifix, he was black. And like a black man would, he hung in the corner of a retreat center room. I watched the eyes of my friends question the possibility, how we all love a good parody, right? Crucifix or tree, a white man put him there. If Jesus were any other color, I still think Pilate was a white man. I guess there's a little bit of color in God in every single one of us, even the dark parts. My confirmation saint was the only black woman I could find. A slave who loved the white man enough for her to be in heaven with him, to be canonized. She served a white man and a God alike. I wonder if she feels as lonely as I do. Does she feel alone in the communion of saints? They would say she was in chains but her spirit was free. How we all love a good paradox, right? I think it's crazy. I think it's crazy how almost all the black saints were slaves. I wonder if they really, I wonder, I wonder if they really died for their God or for their race. I wish I could tell her. I wish I could tell her I want to be a good black girl, whatever that means. But I also want to be a good Catholic girl. We all know what that means. I want to be honey nut cheerio commercial happy, the Sunday school lecture for me. I'm a black girl singing hymns I do not understand. I cannot afford any more broken dreams. I do not ever think I will learn how to fly. I am only one of you. I wish our God had a name. So he'd never be mistaken for a less loving one, for a white one, for melted candles in a dark sanctuary. I hope he knows who he is to all of us because I do not know who I am. Caught between a God and a people, a Lord and an equal, I don't know who I want to be. So I sit in the corner of her retreat center room, head hung, feeling more like Jesus than any of them could ever comprehend, crucified, hated, subservient like an outcast. I laugh now, but it is not a joke. I laugh now, but I am not a joke. My people have always been a good parody, a good paradox, always the lesser of a greater God, but you want to know the truth? I don't really care what God looks like. I just hope he's there for me. Looks through and sees my soul without color. Maybe I can only pray to God at night because he can't see me. Maybe he'll be impartial of my plea. Call me a daughter by my voice. God too thinks I sound white. These hands, these hands have learned to pray. These hands have learned to beg. These hands have learned to surrender. Not to a God I don't see myself, but to a God I don't see enough of myself in. Because I'm still a black girl singing in the dead of night. I took these broken dreams and learn to fly all my life. I've been waiting for this moment to be free. Thank you. Woo. Woo. Yeah, I can turn the mics off and you can give them a little applause too. Woo. That was incredible. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> oh, I'm just still recovering from that. Wow, that is that was amazing. That was amazing, Julian. Um, dang. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, so uh, yeah, as I can see all the comments. Everyone's everyone is also reacting. They're acting that way to to, to Julian's work. It was just really really amazing. Um, so um, next we have um, Madison Petaway. Madison Petaway is here. Um, so Madison Petaway is a teenage performance poet tackling issues such as mental health and black communities and the downfalls of the education system. After being part of Houston's youth poetry team, Metaphor Houston for a year, she was chosen by Mayor Sylvester Turner to be Houston's 2020 Youth Poet Laureate. Wow. Other accomplishments include being a female narrator for the Holocaust Museum Houston's Be the Chains audio tour and publication of her poem To Be a Black Girl in the New York Times. Madison Petaway plans to attend University of Texas Austin this fall as an English major before pursuing further education in criminal justice. Madison, thank you so much for being with us. Yes. Okay, can y'all see me? <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can see. Hi that. guys, I'm going to be reading three poems today. So starting with To Be a Black Girl, my poem published in the New York Times. 
I wish I understood what it is like to be a black girl, to know myself like a dictionary definition, to see something wrong with the world and position yourself in a warrior stance, hand on hip, leg cocked, head tilted, acrylics pointed, ready to clap back, snap in a deep formation, increase my volume for dramatic effect, and even then, I pose no real threat. The art of literacy is not aggressive. My whiplash tongue hurt as passive for never using my racist dialect, or as my white teacher put it, never leaving your cultural imprint. Black and brown faces look at me and betrayal surrender is not the way of a woman of color. I raise my fist to protest only to be met with the shaking of hands, gifted opportunity after opportunity for not a step outside my mark. I don't want this privilege. Do you know what it's like to be at war with yourself, to want to strangle your tongue? Would you believe me? If I told you the closest I've ever felt to my own race, mis mispronouncing my own name. Madison was easier to learn. Its origin, a slave master, how I've been taught to say, founding father. A Google search of my surname, Petaway. Did you mean Perry? No, Peter. No, Pettis. Did you mean Petway Plantation? Images. Did you know they were Black like you? Maps. Did you know they moved from North Carolina? Did you know they were from Alabama? Did you know there are subreddits of people looking for other people with the surname Petway because white doctors didn't have the decency to spell our name correctly? There are no dictionaries for names without origins. This is my birthright. And it's not broken, not worn, so I wear it. I heard to be black is synonymous with magic, with beauty, but I feel anything but. A throat that spits flame seems more just than spitting palms. I heard to be black is to bring what you can to the fight. While in a warrior stance, hand on hip, pat and weave, pick and fro, jaw loose is to be a black girl. <laughs> mm. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. That was my first. Mm. Mm. Um, the second piece I have today um, is called Wanted, um, or also to be Black in America. Um, one eye covered by flat ironed hair, wearing the jacket I always wore. I was 11. It was late afternoon. I was in the back seat behind my mother. My father was pulled to the side in our silver sedan. Left index finger rolls down window, open palms to steering wheel. My mother jams the stereo off, documents on dashboard. My brother's frozen gaze forward. I look back. Broken taillight, they said. Suspected criminal. One officer, then five white men. Sirens blaring, hands on Smith and Wessons. A time for running errands. It was night when they let us go. I could see the sun setting behind the officers. The second the sun shines in my eye, an officer locks my gaze, laughs to himself, but I've turned my head forward. Mm. Mm. The last poem is about voting, and I'm actually really proud of this piece, even though I don't quite think it's ready yet, but um, I'm going to read it to you guys anyway. I have stories that will never grace the stage because you'd consider them controversial. I've learned society likes the aftermath, hurt veils and metaphors, but I am invested in what is and whatever was. Make America great again. Just another way to say 1960s meets 2016s as if public lynchings ever disappeared. References to generations past, 50 cent root beers, but no mention of Jim Crow laws. To vote is not just a civic duty, but a victory for our ancestors. Let us not exclude ourselves. There are a hundred million people who don't vote. There are over a hundred million people whose rights are in danger. If you're waiting for the thesis of a story, I can only give you a conclusion. For every ballot unmarked, someone in need wakes up dead. There is no need for analysis, no need to paraphrase this into headline quotes. We are trained in the art of educated guesses rather than asking educated questions. We are the silent majority and we are more dangerous than the politicians we don't vote for. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> what? Wow! Wow, Madison! Wow! Ugh. 
the soul, the soul. You got to the soul. Um, wow, yeah, the, this, every single one of those was just fantastic. Um, thank you so much for that. Yeah, all the comments are blowing up. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, it was amazing, amazing, amazing work. Um, yeah, okay. So um, next up we have, this is a real treat for everyone, um, Deborah Deep Mutin. So Deborah Deep Mutin is an internationally known writer, librettist, educator, activist, performer, and the 2015 Poet Laureate of Houston, Texas. Formerly ranked the number two best female performer um, and the two uh, in the poet in the world, Mouton's work has appeared in Houston Noir by Cossack Press, Black Girl Magic by Haymarket Books, and the Texas Observer, and on such platforms as NPR, BBC, ABC, Apple News, Blavity, Upworthy, and across the TEDx circuit. She has ser served as a contributing writer to Texas Monthly and Glamour Magazine, heralded as a literary genius by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee in 2019. Mouton has published a recent poetry collection, Newsworthy, which has garnished her a pushcart nomination and was named a finalist of 2019 Writers League of Texas Book Award and an honorable mention from the Summerlee Book Prize. A German translation is set to be released in fall 2021. In addition, a storybook opera entitled Lula the Mighty Gria will de debut with Houston Grand Opera in early 2021, and her memoir Black Chameleon is forthcoming by Henry Holt and Company. So Deep holds two bachelor's degrees from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in English and African American studies respectively. She also holds an MED from the University of St. Thomas. She's a certified teacher with the state of Texas and is dedicated over 16 years toward the education of young minds, the expansion of literacy, and the dismantling of literary racism. She currently serves as executive director of VIP Arts Houston, a nonprofit dedicated to marginalized voices in and around Houston, Texas. Her love for community transcends the classroom and the stage, making her a mentor to many and a, and a notable force to be felt. So this is a we have, we have a literary genius with us today, Deborah Deep Mouton. Thank you for being here tonight. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm so excited um, just to be part of this presentation. I think that it is really amazing to center on family because for me, like poets are my family, right? Like literary people are my family. And so just to like listen to, um, I hate to say that they're young poets, but I think, you know, they're young. I love Madison. I love Joanne and have for a while really admired their work. And so it's good to be amongst family, right? Even today um, with the audience and with anyone who's kind of cluing in and tuning in today, you're, you're now like engrafted into the family that we're making um, by doing this. And so thank you all for joining in. Thank uh, you for just having an ear to listen to poetry and to listen to I think the black experience, which is something that for so long, the literary culture has tended to shy away from, right? We think of slavery and its ability to say that reading and writing were illegal. And, and I think in so many ways, the stories that we write, that we craft are, are doing a work in trying to recap and make up for all the history and the time that we've lost holding history in our tongues and not in our books. So thank you for being willing to be here and to uh, just to listen. I'm gonna be reading from my book, Newsworthy, which you'll see the covers behind me. So ignore the one that has like all of the like markings in it, the hairpins, cause I'm hood. Um, I use a hairpins to mark my book, but uh, hopefully we'll enjoy some of the work. So um, I created Newsworthy uh, now a few years ago and I really kind of fell into talking about how the black body is represented in the media, especially when it comes into instances with police brutality and abuses of power. Um, and I wanted to kind of segue that between the experiences that I've personally had with the police, um, as well as the experiences that are more reactionary to things that we think are like the newsworthy stories, right, of the news, right? The names we hold in our mouths, like Philando Castile and like George Floyd, right? These kind of things that we use as tit pegs for a movement and a notion that's happening consistently, even when we're not knowing the names that we're holding. Um, so let's just start, stop talking and start getting into some poems. Here we go. Um, 
the time we learned to report. Summer Stoop, South Central Los Angeles, two children playing news. Josh kneels behind a makeshift cardboard desk, his nine-year-old legs finding it awkward to bend into childhood. Within reach, a yellow play school tape recorder. Inside, a cassette labeled Summertime Jams. MC Hammer, Ace of Bass, recording tabs taped up, cued for erasing and re-recording Josh broadcast. <laughs> Breaking news. Today, a house built with my own two hands went up in a ball of flames. Inside, a brave G.I. Joe tried to save babysitter Barbie, but it was too late. Tear jerker. Now let's go to Amanla in the field. Amanla, his sister, five, pushes flower barrettes from her hair, her forehead, spoon microphone clings to her chin. Today, the jump rope record was broken again, 20 times and counting. I did it. I'm the best. Josh interrupts, says not news, too naive, can't see what's important. Table shutters under silent weight. Amanla stomps out, whispers, I'm going to tell. Now live from the field, cut out spilling from cupped hands. Watch the story light. First time around the block. One, two, three, four, five. Feet syncopate hopscotch under ripe street lights. Sun crawls down the backside of the mountain. We sand our hands in four squares on rubber balls. We bounce Sally Walker and a cool drink of Kool-Aid powdered in sugared Ziploc till all parts of our mouths are stained cherry rebel defiant. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Streets so alive in LA. Don't want nobody want the night to come. Just want the day forever. Run like highway. Turn ourselves invisible when mama calls. Don't don't take that ball angry today done left you boy that street light not hot yet ignore the glow for the sting of pop rocks in our cheeks and big league tiring our chew Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. this time when mama calls seems more ambulance in her throat more flashing lights in her eyes more than just halogen flickering bulb on concrete she says our names like they are blood moons on a clear sky that no one wants to see like a routine turned into red mouth outcry, a frenzy of our shadowy feet cockroaching from the asphalt towards our mother's arms unaware. Five, four, three, two, run. The unknowing left that night. We watched their feet turn Rodney soccer ball. Police no longer a place to run when lost. Police run longer or be a lost place. Colored lips gushing a bloody drink, more thirsty for the darkness than the sun. And we, a chalk outlined number needing to be stumped. Mm. Um, I wanted to start my journey in thinking about like the first time I experienced racism full on. Like I was homeschooled, so I didn't have to deal with it in school early on. Um, but I remember when Rodney King was beaten, right? Like, and I remember being, you know, 60 miles from LA and watching on the news as they replayed this man being beaten brutally by the police. Um, I remember the riots that followed and my mom and dad taking me down to Los Angeles and saying, we're now gonna clean up the riots. And I remember thinking like, why do I need to do this? And my dad's response was because this is your community too, right? And even though it may not have been the community I lived in, that there was something in my skin color and something in the people who were being the point of oppression that made me equally as responsible for their stories as they were. And I think that that has been something that I've carried on in my work of feeling like, you know, when we speak their names, when we call out their stories, right? We are reviving them in the eyes of what is important. Um, and that doesn't just happen in the names that we need, right? Or, or that we know it happens in the ones that we don't too. So um, I had an incident happen when I was a little bit older where my brother was actually arrested um, in the middle of the night uh, and I write about it. Here we go. Josh, 15, ventures out. An adolescent need for speed. He foregoes dressing, white flag of a t-shirt and boxer shorts. He's not planning on stopping anywhere. Officers pull him over on the 91 between Compton and his home, say he was driving 20 over the limit, say he was swerving, but don't test his breath. Record his name as an alias for a fugitive of a similar name, different face, address, age, but similar name, wanted for Grand Theft Auto. Josh, visibly shaken, denies any affiliation, still booked. He is now suspect. He calls his mother, but it's the middle of the night and it rings unanswered in the dark. We are silhouettes, 
bodies morphed into shadows lost to the spotlight. Um, my brother spent seven days in a maximum security prison at the age of 15 for a crime he didn't commit. And all that stood between him and being released was them running his fingerprints, which they refused to do. Um, and I find myself coming back to that as my heart for where I stand in thinking about social justice, right? That this is the story that I know and have lived, but that there's so many that we don't know that are happening every day. And unless the system and the structures of that system are challenged, we will continue to live them and continue to hear them in the silence. Um, and I found myself really like taken up by, by everything that was happening around me and really kind of bombarded by the amount of names and the litany of bodies that were falling. Um, I really found myself provoked around the death of Trayvon Martin. And it seemed like just an utter onslaught, like a war had just been unleashed on everything with a black body. And um, I found myself stumbling into this poem, which is kind of where the cover of the book comes from as well. Uh, and this one I'm gonna perform. So there's a different version in the book, but feel free to just enjoy the performance. I have felt the weather changing, seeing the falling leaves painting the sidewalk of mosaic of autumn. As a transplanted Texan, these hoof printed falls only remind me of one thing. And this year I heard the government is opening hunting season early. Now they know every good hunter needs two things to be successful, a good dog and a good gun. Gotta have something to sniff and some way to shoot. It's important to get as close to your target as humanly possible. Make sure they can't see you clearly. This can be tricky. Hunting through the thicket and the cloak of night offer easy solutions. Now there's no use in standing on top of an open hill watching surrounding pastures and bushy banks if they're out of range, no. A better location is just inside the hood, I mean woods. So that if a boy, I mean buck approaches, you can move back and stalk through cover. Now this could take years to perfect. I spotted one once, dark fur, oversized antlers, said the ones whose pelt sags just below their waist have the most tender innards. This one looked injured, dip when he walked hand holding his privates like somebody already took a shot at him, looked under 35, that's good. Get him too old, they might've learned how to run, how to keep quiet and invisible. They say the most popular attractant is corn, but I've learned flashy jewelry, loud music do the trick. Want a guaranteed kill? Use some paper money. You can also purchase a call. One sounds like a mother's voice screaming out to Jesus, the other the ringing of Sean's wedding bells. The last one sounds like a sweet young girl whispering, I love you. Anything that sounds familiar or offers false hope. Once you got them in your crosshairs, aim right under the hoodie, stand your ground, shoot and kill, invite a friend, tell him we don't shoot to eat, we hunt for the fun of the sport. Let's see how many rounds we could put in him for his knees to buckle, for his family to come looking for him. You know, the younger it is we catch him, the more likely it is we'll make the news. Picture us standing next to his 145 pound trophy body like the catch of a lifetime. We could be legends like Irwin v. Crocodile or, 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 or Fudd v. Duck or Police v. Human Black Body. It's human nature that the most dominant species assert themselves over the ones who pose the greatest threat. That's how we define a hero here in this thicket and this brush. They could try to camouflage themselves with nothing that young, that black, that male will ever fit in. I follow him once for 19 blocks. Let my canine sniff out his blackberry scent. Didn't have my shotgun, so I just shot till my gun was empty. I wore his skin like a Halloween costume. They say the darker the hide, the sweeter the blood. And this year I've learned the government is waiving fees for permits. All you need is a, is a rifle, a gun, a good hiding place. Try an alley next to a low performing high school. Don't have one, you your own front yard. Plan a hedge, stand in plain sight. Remember, if they come near you, it's only defending yourself. This is the circle of life. Somebody gotta be predator, something, someone always gotta pray. Um, and it was something about Trayvon that lingered with me, right? Um, beyond it feeling like this opening firing of all things young and black, you know? And as, there was a moment I think where I thought that it was just men that were uh, the victim of this thing. And, um, and I, I wanted to lean into that as a black woman, right? Like, as a black woman at that time had no children. Um, and then my father was older and not really like out there in the world as much as, you know, I, other people may have been, I, I wanted to really lean into it and I found myself pregnant. Um, here we go. Sanford Sweet. I remember the iced tea we used to brew on my mother's back porch just outside her garden. How it steeped against the ground till deep seeded. How the sticky sweet Alabama honey stuck to our everywhere. 
I wonder how hard they had to scrub to get the Trayvon off. Was it calm George calling it in? Dream of paradise under an Arizona rainbow, sepia, ignorant bliss. Whisper under your breath that if we stack flowers at every site, this world can be eaten again. I stand here in the wilderness of kitchen. The linoleum tiles a dry bubbling beneath my bare feet. Our nursery is quiet tonight for all of the right reasons. The eerie of crib mobile plays soundtrack to a muted television. Over a casket of fruit spoiling before a bite, under the crescendo of a kettle in the most shameful whisper, I say, I'm so glad we had a girl. And just as immediately as that notion fell from my mouth, um, Rekia Boyd was shot and killed, right? Um, we started to see things like um, Desharia in, in Texas getting beaten and held with her face in the lawn by a police officer while she was just going to a pool, right? Um, we started realizing that gender constructs had nothing to do with how we were seen in the eyes of a victim. And then sometimes was actually worse, right? That women die just as often, but get much less coverage. Um, and so I, I found myself struggling, right? With my daughter to come up with a way to talk to her about our resilience and to talk to her about um, what was happening. You know, I, I think even as a young age, I remember being her, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, but I remember traveling to a friend of mine who was protesting outside of Sandra Bland's memorial and um, bringing her fruit and my daughter being in the back seat and people running out to the car to try to assault us, right? And thinking like, where's the line between where my voice lives and the danger for my own child live? Um, and I don't know that anybody else has to deal with that, right? It has to think through that as a real thought, um, that there's this danger everywhere that even like on a work trip, I find myself stumbling into danger on Baltimore from Beeville. Work found us in Beeville, where the prison is currency and the hotels give fresh cookies to cut the taste of fear after six. The sun rose in the lobby over Texas-shaped waffles, Fruit Loops, thick oatmeal. This town, no destination, reports the national news. Star Spangled's birthplace finds police officer unresponsive after rioters attacked. Fires sparked during funeral of Freddie Gray, whom police left to suffocate under the weight of his own body on the cold floor of their van while they watched without response. This is a test. This station is conducting a test. If this had been an actual emergency. Chucker's mouth a murmured slow over continental breakfast of bleach biscuits smothered in brown gravy. Clenched their fists till purple pulses around each knuckle. We sit at a separate but equal banquet, chewing slowly, wondering what part of Texas we've waded into. Um, I'm gonna do like two more, is that cool? That's cool. Yeah. I was like, are we good on time? I'm always like watching time. Um, so when I found myself pregnant again, I wanted a girl, right? I was like, look, look, even though the danger's, you know, the same, there's something that makes me feel like the danger for a boy is higher. And a lot of that has to do with the media, right? We see shows like Cops, where we see predominantly male offenders running from the police. We, we see coverage in news where we see black men as a threat. We clutch our purses around them, right? Like, and by we, I don't mean me, right? Like, but as a society, right? We find ourselves falling into these tropes where black women are aggressive and angry, but manageable. And somehow black men are much more dangerous and volatile. Um, and I think that there were some things in my programming that said that maybe maybe having a girl, I'd be able to keep her safer. Um, and I found myself with a boy in my stomach and I remember being so scared and crying my eyes out, right? And thinking, what am I gonna do with this son now? Um, so you know, I ran into complications where like nine weeks in, I started to hemorrhage wildly and almost lost my son and um, was able to kind of hold on to him. And I, I didn't even want to write about him, honestly, because I was so scared that he would be taken from me so early. And I think that those thoughts of when will my child die have really lived with me even now. You know, first it was like, will I ever be able to hold him to term because black women, right? We die in childbirth, we don't even make it out. And then it was, will my dad child from SIDS? And then it was, will somebody kill my child? Well, he's outside playing. Will he hold the wrong water gun, right? Will he look at someone the wrong way? In Texas, you know, outside of Houston and even sometimes within, 
you know, will he find someone that has the wrong temperament? And when I finally stumbled upon writing to, about him, I think the floodgates just opened, right? And um, I call this poem, Release. Here we go. When I decided to become a mother, people warned me that having a child is forever like having your heart floating around outside of your body. After birthing two hatchlings into the gulf, I have come to know that motherhood is not being any less than human. It is more about learning how to envelop the sea. It is watching your skin soft to slick, to suckle, to cradle. It is training your blind spots for the infinity of sight lines. Each surge of hormones turning us more cephalopod and if I never believed in evolution, my daughter confirmed me a sea monster. My son made me more Ursula, more sea witch in drag. Did you know that an octopus has three hearts? One to take all of the rejection life sins and the other two for the pearls we breathe for. My children are midnight risings of my own palpitation. Their tangled sleep is me wrestling with my own tentacles. The hardest part is not looking away when I see too much of my ink blooming in them. The world has tried to tell me that I can't have it all the abyss and the surface too, but I respond with my children's pyroclastic laughter. My confidence is a constant in camouflage. My spirit has scraped the bottom of an ocean more times than I want to admit, turning man into nightmare and expectation into sinkhole. But my children give the poor unfortunate of my soul venom and a song. Give me reason to unearth myself from the sand every dawn and scheme us into a better sea. And I wouldn't trade a limb for them, wouldn't beg for bones or legs. I am happy drowning my sadness in their salt water cure all. Did you know that a mother can swallow a ship whole? That if you come for her offspring, she will drag you under. Davy Jones is just a woman after too many miscarriages. When we have been stretched to distant oceans, when the pirates of work and school and sleep and this stage have stolen our collective chest bump and propulsion, we be devilfish, lightly touching barbs to get used to their cut. We are not hard. We are divided tether. We are an eight-legged doomsday unfurling nets curled inside us to seem larger than we are and motherhood is a monstrosity waiting to surge it is a strangling safety it is knowing that you have all the reasons to whirlpool and are just waiting on the moment to release um and i think even in that you know like i am married to a black man I have birthed black children and that existence at times has been the hardest balance, right? Of, of wondering where does joy stop for, um, for pain to live and vice versa. And, and I've come to understand that, you know, I, I say in, in my most recent memoir, right? Like joy doesn't borrow from sorrow. Like joy doesn't have to make room for sorrow, right? Like they, they can live simultaneously. They can live in this, you know, the same breath. We, we can laugh at a funeral repast, right? Um, we can, we can um, cry at a wedding. We, we constantly live in multiple spheres of emotion. And that space is the one that I feel like inhabits both love and um, fear, um, inhabits both resilience and fear right um we find a way as black people to balance it and i and i'm not to say that no one else does but there is a space for us that we have learned that we do not get to stop one feeling for another um and i think that is part of what makes us us right and it's part of what makes the work and the poetry what it is 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 our ability to balance all those things you know um in my upcoming memoir, Black Chameleon, I take on the idea of what is Black womanhood from the point of view of mythology and really backing into thinking about like, for the Black woman, you can't just tie it to someplace in Africa because most of us don't know where that place is, right? Like I can't just throw a dart and hit Senegal and feel like I'm connected. And the same way I can't swipe my cheek to an ancestry DNA and suddenly feel like I've inherited a culture. For us, there is an origin story that lives right here, right in the South, because that's where we landed, that says that we get to redefine even how slavery is seen as not a place of suffering, but a starting point to an elevation that is beyond belief. And I think the more we lean into that, the more that we start to take the moments of our life and realize that we can be complex beings. Um, so I'm gonna close this with one last poem, which is called The Time We Shook to Death. And I think for me, it, it really does talk to kind of this duality of being able to exist in all of our feelings at the same time. In the stretch of I-10 from Baton Rouge to Houston, Viter, historical Bermuda Triangle for all things black. 
husband and a mandler rushing back to watch your children rise for school. The lights flick on just past city limits. Trains now after Philando, a man knows the drill, hands on dash, head bowed, window cracked just enough to be audible, phone landscape to cover the widest terrain. Mothers are supposed to shield their children's eyes when their fathers expire before them. The children are asleep in their own beds, but her hands itch to press their lids closed harder. She sees him laid before her, his last breath brushed across her cheek. The officer shines in on her hands, tells her all of that is not necessary. Yes, she says it is. She talks loud and clear for the transcript to come. He runs his hand across the butt of his gun, then disappears. She and her husband are two branches of the same road. She takes fear, he takes resolve asks her why she is so afraid. He has reconciled death as ordained with godly timing. She prays not to know God this way. The officer returns with a warning for driving on the left too long, tells them to get right, drives away. A mandala shakes through hours of alternate endings. His hand in hers, pulse elevated. Highways in moonlight, how we tremble together. This the way we love. Thank you all so much. Um, if you want to get the book, Newsworthy, I think we'll be sharing the link to that as well. Um, you could always check out my website as well, livelifedeep.com. Um, please continue this conversation because it's definitely, definitely a needed one. And I can't wait to see what this Q&A brings. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so much. Oh, that was... <laughs> That was absolutely incredible. That was, uh, it was levels, uh, uh, just so much, it was so much. Um, yeah, uh, this the heart is <laughs> so good. Um, yeah, I think we're all kind of still recovering from, from this brilliance. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, there's all the chills, goosebumps, all of that is just wonderful, wonderful, um, yeah. So um, do we have any questions from the audience? Does anyone have any questions for um, our poets to, today? So, you know, while, while some of our audience is thinking, I might have some questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, and this is for anyone who'd like to respond. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your artistic process? How long does it take for you to write a poem? Um, does a poem just kind of come to you? Or are you, are you kind of moved by a certain emotion and that results in you writing a poem? Um, if anyone wants to respond to that. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, and maybe Madison and Joanne, if y'all are still around, y'all can uh, jump in as well. Um, it just depends for me, you know, newsworthy kind of fell out of my body in like six months, you know, like I was like, Bleh, here's all the things I've been feeling for a while. Yeah. Um, and some of it was collected from works that I had been kind of working on, but the majority of it kind of all just like came out at once. Um, I find myself when the work is really calling me like waking at, at, at kind of the, the wake, the witching hour to write and not being able for it to let me go. But there are pieces that, you know, I've really taken a long time with. So I think it, it just really depends on the piece. You know, I have a file that's like good lines for non-existent poems that are all the poems that I, I like, like that's a dope line and it has no phone. <laughs> um, and I think as just as much, you know, there's poems I've abandoned because the impetus of them has kind of left or the, or scenarios, especially when you're writing about social themes, when the world changes, sometimes your poem doesn't become needed anymore. And so being, knowing kind of when to abandon that, I think those things all play a part. Mm, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, so I can just hop on top of that. Um, so my writing process is very like, um, I don't know, and I don't know if Deep can relate to this, but I always see like this advice, especially for young writers that is like, get into a schedule, write every day. And it's like, I just, I never have the motivation to do that. And I definitely feel like that's the quickest way to burn yourself out. So me, I just kind of write like on the go. I always have my uh, notes app on my phone, like open, and I'll always just like start typing. Um, whatever is really on my mind. Um, and so like, I'll do that. And then like weeks later, maybe I'll come back to it. 
Um, sometimes I delete like lines from poems and then I go into like my deleted folder and I, sometimes I pull some of those lines out and I'm like, hey, this is actually really good. And I string it into something. Um, I like, and Joanne was on the uh, Metaphor Houston team with me. So she kind of knows my writing process, I think, or like we might have a similar writing process. Um, but I know I've definitely started with like one poem and then it's gone drastically somewhere else, like over the span of a few months, because you learn, you grow, you realize something works or maybe it doesn't. And so it's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. This is so exciting to hear all of your processes too. Just like, it's very, very awesome. I would say I, also to kind of add to what Madison, I, I don't have a schedule for poems. I agree with you, Madison. What I have found though is when I started writing like stage plays or prose work, um, like longer fiction work, I'm able to say like, I'm going to write a thousand words a day and really kind of stick to it and, it and it's more profitable. But I think there was just like something about poetry that is so like visceral to the soul and so like, pulled from reaction that it is really hard to try to narrow that down to like this is the Wednesday feeling now you're going to write about it like it just doesn't it just doesn't work it doesn't work right right yeah that's 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 great um Joanne did you have anything to 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 add to that I just want to make sure we have your voice too uh yeah I completely agree with Madison um uh just like writing it's kind of like it's something that takes and you take from like whatever you're experiencing in your real life and that's where most of the truth comes from so it's like whatever you're experiencing like sometimes I'm in a lecture or like I'm riding the bus and I'm like wow I like there's this thought in my mind or something that like I'm pondering about or like it's just like swirling up in there and it's like if I get it down on paper um I can look at it later and like think about it or like if I wake up in the morning and I'm like, wow, I had a dream about something and like, that sounds really cool. And like, I don't know how like to like process this in my mind. So I put it on paper or I put it in my notes app or something like that. And it makes it a lot better. So it's just kind of like, there isn't really like a, there's a process in like organizing those thoughts and like formulating them into something bigger, but like, there's no like, oh, I'm going to sit down or like a lot, like three hours every day to write a poem, if that makes sense. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, it's really lovely to, to, to get a peek into all of your, your minds. Um, so uh, we have some questions from the audience that have just kind of popped up. So um, Denise Newsom says that um, Madison said that she wasn't sure if her poem was ready. Uh, what indications does she have when, when the writing is complete? <laughs> um, okay. So that's a tough one because um, I feel like has like nearly every artist, it's kind of hard to think, okay, this piece is done. Um, but my poem, like to be a black girl or the poem, the second poem that I read, like wanted, I don't know how to explain it to someone on the outside, but I just kind of get this feeling of like, um, not necessarily that it's perfect, but I feel like it conveys, um, a story the best way that I know how to. Um, and I feel like it'll, I feel like it's kind of timeless. Like there are some pieces that I read that I've written and I'm like, it works now, but later on when I reread it, I'm like, eh, that doesn't really, um, or it's like usually poems that I have memorized, I uh, have more of a rhythm to it. So I guess how I know a poem is done is when I really get into the rhythm of like memorizing it and like um, really understanding the piece and like playing around with it vocal wise. I think that's how I know that like I'm officially ready. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we also love that piece that you, that you performed today. So um, great. Yeah, so we have, um, yeah, some more questions are, um, oh, so um, also, um, We'll have a few door prizes for those who can't, um, who can stay until the end. So that'll be after our Q and A. So if you want some prizes, they'll be coming our way. Um, so Reka Subramanian um, asked us, um, can you talk a little bit about each of your relationship with an audience, the ones you, the ones you read to, the ones in your head, who you're writing to, who your people are? Do you have a call and response in your head as you write? That's a great question. And that can be for everyone. 
Um, Joanne, I feel like we could answer this one from being on like metaphor. Um, this question actually really reminded me of when we were on metaphor Houston. Um, and I think I had this problem the most, I guess, but I think me and Joanne kind of had similar problems where it's like when we would read, it would kind of sound like robotic or like we didn't really have like a lot of emotion in it. And that's because it was like, um, I don't know, kind of, I guess, like distancing yourself from um, the um, your writing. But um, our coaches were really great. And like when we went on stage or like before we went on stage, our um, coaches would usually talk to us and they'd be like, um, like, who are you taking on stage with you? And like, kind of like, you need to convey that to the audience. You need to show that audience who you're taking up on stage with you. And I think that like really helps um, a lot. Um, so I do forget this sometimes I get really in my own head, but um, I guess when I write my pieces, I do kind of had like, have like this, um, like who I'm expecting to hear this piece, I guess. The pieces that I read today, I guess I'm like, uh, when I was writing it, I was definitely hoping um, for not shock value, but like, I was definitely hoping that some people would be like, oh my gosh, like that hit deep. I didn't even think about that. Um, and that they're kind of like more of the social justice type and they're more of the, wow, maybe I should do something type. So that's how I think about it. It's <laughs> great. It's great. Joanne, you want to back up? You want to backdoor that? Uh, yeah, so I completely agree with Madison. Like, just like, as she said, when we're on the team, like it was kind of like when you write something on paper, it's very easy for it to become like monotonous and you're just like, oh, reading like a poem, even though you wrote it and there are emotions behind it. But um, our coach, shout out to being in voice, but our coaches would always tell us that um, bring the person on stage with you. And I will never forget our writing process began earlier on in the year. And by the time we got to um, our performances in the summer, we're able to really like express our emotions properly. And it was like, taking something from the paper and bringing it to life on stage. And um, there was this one specific poem I wrote about my grandfather. And when I first wrote it, it was very, it just, it was bland. It was kind of like a history paper kind of, it just, it wasn't alive. But by the time summer came, when I first performed it, like it was the first time my mom, like my family got to see me perform. And like, I've been performing for like a really long time. And I, I brought my grandfather on stage with me, like in, like in my words and like my expressions. And I cried, like I, I'm not very emotional, but like, I just couldn't help it because it was my truth. And I was able to like share that with not only the audience, the reader, but my family with my grandfather. And it, it was like, this piece of art is for somebody. And it's just anything else. Like if you're writing about black women or about your sexuality or anything like that, your identity, there's always someone who can resonate and take from that. And it's just kind of like giving them your emotion allows them to also feel that emotion as well. So, you know, it's, it's for others as well. Your work is for others as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that what Madison and Joanne both kind of hearken to is like that I think spoken word artists really do look at audience in a very different way than other people do at times. You know, um, the way that I approach an audience for a stage piece versus the way that I do for something that's just gonna live in a book are two really different processes, you know. Um, for me in spoken word in slam, um, I'm I'm thinking about specifically for competition, right? I'm thinking about what score is best. I'm thinking about who's in the audience. How are they going to connect to these things, right? Like like we can say all a lot of other things, but if we're in competitive mode, we're looking for good scores, right? Um, and then I think that outside of that, you know, we're looking for a room to feel us. We're looking to be able to come in and take the temperature of the space. Um, the time of when this is happening, you know, what politically is happening around us, you know, in a lot of ways we are griots, we are carrying history and we're figuring out how do we give you the slice of what you need to know at that moment. And I think that like that impetus has been one that has transcended over to a lot of my other work because I was always so conscious and so cognizant of the audience and the ways that they were going to tap into and what they would take away from my work on in spoken word that when I come to a stage play or to writing an opera, right, which I did with the Houston Grand Opera, it was, I wanted to sit in that room with everyone and I wanted to hear the gasps and I wanted to hear the snicker. And I wanted to be the orchestrator of the emotion and the emotional tone of that 
that thing. And I think that that is kind of how it all works with our work, right? Is that we're thinking not only about like, what is our audience going to know, but deeply, what is our audience going to feel? Because we know that at the heart of it, if we can make them feel something, that's going to be where change starts to really live in the body. Mm, mm, I love that. I love that. Change starts in the body. That's, that's great. Um, yeah. So um, Denise Newsom asked, um, can, the, can you tell us a little bit more about Metaphor Houston for those of you that are part of Metaphor Houston? Do y'all want to talk about it or do you want me to talk about it? It's up to you. <laughs> No, I can talk about it. Uh, Metaphor Houston? Okay. Um, you know what? I can talk about my experience. Do you, do you want to explain what it is? Because I'll just... <laughs> I can. So Metaphor Houston is um, part of the National Youth Poetry Slam Coalition run by Youth Speaks. It's hosted by writers in the schools. Um, I know so much because I was a coach for Metaphor for about seven years, but it was prior to the brilliant Madison and Joanne. So I don't have relationships with them because of that, unfortunately. Um, but I did get to, to kind of hold hands with a lot of younger poets as they were coming up and defining their voices. And so the idea is that those youth are kind of picked in the early spring and are able to kind of workshop work write collaboratively as well as refine individual work that they take to the competition Brave New Voices at the end of the summer where they compete um, internationally amongst youth teams from as far away as like Cape Town, right? Like South Africa um, and right here. And so I think it's just a really great place for young writers to be able to refine what it is that they wanna say, to think through audience and to, you know, kind of polish their performance skills before they kind of take off into their own careers. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, in that respect so that's like the more like professional version of it like everything you go through um so like my perspective of like actually like uh being on the team as like a member is um it's definitely kind of like weird starting out especially i felt it was kind of weird for me because i didn't know what i was signing up for i had never really heard of like slam poetry so like i kind of had this understanding it was a competition but like never did it occur to me like what I was competing for until I like won the final uh like I was like one of the five or whatever and I like won the final and then um our coach gathered us around he started giving us a schedule of like okay we're gonna do practices and I was like practices what like I didn't know I didn't know that I went home and I was like we're, we're going to Las Vegas like I didn't I didn't know all this but um so like it it was definitely kind of weird because um I had talk to Joanne from like the prelims, which is like the very first like a uh, uh, like uh, poetry slam like in the series. It goes prelims, semifinals, and then finals. Um, so I had known Joanne and I had known like one other member on our team since the like preliminaries. And it was just so weird because it's like we were, you know, cordial, but it wasn't really like that's like that's my competitor. It's like dang, they're so good. And then we got on the team and um we were all just a bunch of rambunctious like kids, I guess, like teens. And then later it kind of ended up as like family. Um, we were in, uh, when we were at the Brave New Voices competition in Las Vegas, I remember like we always wanted to be together. Like we were always making jokes, always had inside uh, jokes. Um, I remember like even when we lost, I was really bummed and everybody was like really uh, there to support me and everything. Um, and then later on, everyone was just making jokes about our poems together. And so it's like, it definitely becomes family. And like, I still keep in touch with everybody. I know Joanne still keeps in touch with everybody. So yeah, it really is like kind of turns into like a fraternity sorority. It does like, there's no word for like co-ed fraternity, but like whatever that is, right? Like that's what it turns into, you know, it, it got to be a point at some point where like I could go to any city any major city and pick up a phone call and be like I'm a poet and I'm looking for somewhere to stay and within an hour I would have somewhere to stay someone to feed me like it just really does turn into like that thing that I hear people that are in sororities because I'm not in one right like talk about that they could do with their sands and everything like that's how I feel about poets right like I show up and I'm like poet that's what's up right like like we connect in ways that that is really kind of kind of great that's awesome that's awesome yeah Thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's great to know that there's like a little family element involved in, with all of that. That's great. And then they just show up for each other. Um, so Crystal Seahorn says, what is, so this is for uh, Ms. Mouton, 
what is DEEP an acronym for? Yeah, uh, it's it started out probably not this. Well, I don't know. I don't know what it started out as, but determined to excel in everything promised. So I found that quickly, like the world around me wanted me to have a certain kind of success, whether it was like be a doctor or be a lawyer, which there's nothing wrong with those things. They just also are not what I intended or planned or made to do, <laughs> right? Like, and I, I tried to fit into that box and it didn't work because I didn't belong in that box. And so when I really started thinking about like why God put me here on this earth and what I was meant to accomplish, I started really kind of recalibrating myself and saying like, I want to be determined to excel at those things, right? The ones that I was made for and crafted for. And if that doesn't mean being a millionaire, okay, cool. If it does, I'm good with that too, right? But, you know, to, to be able to say like, as long as I know at the end of the day that my purpose is fulfilled, I'm down with that. Like I remember standing outside of one of the stage performances I did and a you know, a young person coming up to me and saying like, what you said today made me feel seen because I've been really struggling to feel like I have a purpose and, you know, I'm, I'm so far away from home and everything. And then just began to like ball their eyes out. And we just had this moment, like amongst this huge crowd of me holding their hands and saying like, I see you, you're here. It's fine. This is great. Like you're supposed to be, you're right where you're supposed to be. And in those like three to five minutes feeling like all of the production stuff was great and beautiful and the, and the critiques and all that, but that maybe that moment was why all of it had to happen, right? Like for me and them to stand there in that moment and for them to be reassured on why they were here on this earth. And so like I lean into those kinds of experiences. Wow, wow, that's inspirational. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, and that moment of connection there where it's kind of like you've started to see what your purpose might be and you, you really understand it and really feel it, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. Wow. Thanks. Thank you for that. Well, it's now time. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Let me give my thank yous to everyone now. I am sure that you will agree with me that this was truly an inspiring and heartwarming celebration of poetry and great works of Black heritage. So it is time to give thanks. First of all, I want to thank all the participants, we had over 40 people attend this morning. Thank you for finding the time to share this celebration with us. You are all so very awesome. I want to specially thank Ms. Mouton, who has shared so much wisdom and insight in her verses. And it really gives us time to pause and reflect on our place in this United States of America and the spaces that we can create for ourselves so that we can speak out for social justice and equity for all of us, that we have a place to hear our own voices. I want to also thank Miss Mary Sutton for her encouraging and inspiring word. Oh boy, I so enjoyed, and I'm sure you all did, the two young poets, Joanne Eriam and Madison Petaway. You gave us such an enriching and entitling performance. We enjoyed it so much. So thank you, young people. You did a great, wonderful job. All right, I also want to thank Dr. McCauley. Dr. McCauley, I am so proud of you. You have done such an awesome job this morning, guiding us through the program. You have done an excellent job. Keep up the great work, my dear. I want to also thank Dr. Simu for bringing his greetings and remarks on Black history. I especially also want to thank Crystal Sihon, I don't know what we would have done without you, my dear. You are awesome. I'm going to steal you. We are going to steal you in the College of Education every time we have something. I also want to thank Lindsay Ford from the library. She was so awesome, very quiet, but doing such great work to help us get this thing going. And last but not least, I want to thank Dr. Janice Newsom. And before I thank her, I want to say that Mr. Newsom, thank you for sharing your works and your perspective and how you do your work. It was very inspiring. Thank you for sharing that video with us. And last but not least, I want to say 
Dr. Newsom, Dr. Janice Newsom, thank you for making Black History Month a reality for us in the College of Education so that we can share these wonderful events with everyone that participated. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful afternoon, everybody.